Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. Then the Lord said to Nathan, then the Lord said, sent Nathan to David and came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children, and it would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now the traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock of his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned against the man, And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. And he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. It is I who anointed you king over Israel. And it is I who delivered you from the hands of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? By doing evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the son of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it in sec- Indeed, you did it secretly. But I will do these things before all Israel and under the sun. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we're so thankful that we can worship you in this facility. We're thankful that you are in control of your church and the people and everything that's going on around us. Lord, we just pray that we will focus on the mission of just calling the world to salvation and being a church, a church of people that are willing to stand for what we believe and love one another and love the people around us. And Lord, just witness to people as you come into contact with them, as you provide opportunities. And Lord, just by doing that, we are spreading and proclaiming the gospel and doing what we're called to do as Christians. Lord, I just pray this church will continue to just stand for the gospel and uh, just love one another. And Lord, I just pray for our nation. I pray for our president. I pray for the leaders of the nation. As much as they think they're running things, Lord, we know that you have a purpose in everything that you've uh, called them to do and everything that they're doing, that you just have a plan. And we put our faith and trust in you. In thy name we pray. Amen. If you feel comfortable, remain standing as we sing. Our God is great, the Father of creation. His splendor fills the earth. The lightning crash, the thunder sings his praises. The galaxies can't help but shout his word. My soul must sing to you an offering. How great you are. My soul must sing, oh let the heavens ring.
Let's sing this out. Our King. Our King will come with trumpet blast resounding to claim His blood washed bright. He'll rend the skies descending in His glory and in an instant faith will turn to sight. My soul you 
Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. What
your streets and land set your church on fire when this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray morning. This week we continue through the book of Matthew with chapter 7. I'll be reading the first 14 verses covering some of the most known and cited verses of the New Testament in secular society, but often the most misused. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible, starting with verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet, and then tear you to pieces." Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will, be, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we continue in our worship through the preaching, Lord. Lord, I ask as we think on these these verses that you help us to, to grow in our spirit of you, Lord. Help us to be discerning believers, Lord. And in our discernment, Lord, we ask that you, you temper it with a spirit of humility, Lord. That as we, uh, we attempt to disciple those around us, whether it be our family, our friends, or our church, that uh, we disciple ourselves first, Lord. And that we continue to grow ourselves as we help others to grow in your body, Lord. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Today is uh, different. And this is the first time since we've been back in uh, May that this has happened. And that is that I have not had a trial run preaching through the sermon. Uh, This is the first time I'm going to preach it for the week. Because I always have been preaching it for the camera each week. And now today, uh, we've started something new. We're going to be having, uh, this sermon will actually be online next week. And the sermon that Ken preached two weeks ago will be online today. So actually, uh, one, one hitch for you as well, if you weren't here two Sunday nights ago, then the sermon that's online today will be something that you haven't heard. So, uh, but then next week, of course, the sermon that's online will be the sermon you heard last week. Okay. All right, so we are in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. As Eric said, uh, this is a very well-known passage in secular society as well as in the church, and perhaps one of the most misunderstood verses in all of the Bible, uh, encouraging not to judge so that you will not be judged. And I think that the, 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 you know, there are several definitions of this word in, in the English, just as there is in the Greek. And I, if you think of judgment as, as discernment, judgment as uh, appraising things, then the, this idea of judge not is, should be our uh, slogan for this country. Because as far as critical thinking and logical thinking and putting things together and really paying attention to what people are saying and doing, we don't have a clue. And the academics in college lead the way in stupidity. 
That's uh, just the way it is. Now, there are many good academics. We're going to have one on the panel tonight who is a college professor. I'm not saying all of them. I'm just saying many of them. And all the 60s radicals have come home to roost, and it's an interesting time. However, we're called to be discerning, and we're also called for something else. In our discernment, we're called to be merciful. And that's something else that we don't have anymore, do we? If you disagree with me, I can't tolerate not simply your point of view, I can't tolerate you. Uh, if you've never read D.A. Carson's book on the intolerance of intolerance, you should read that. It really is another really fine book on where we are in our society. I, you know, I read 1984, I read A Brave New World, and I read a book by Neil Postman uh, called Amusing Ourselves to Death. How many of you have read Amusing Ourselves to Death? You ever read that? I, I know that Rod has. And you, you've read it. Uh, you have not read that, Derek? Amusing Ourselves to Death? I'm thinking about doing that in our, in our men's book study. Uh, it is really, it was written in the, in the, I think in the late 80s, early 90s, and it is so prophetic as well. Amusing Ourselves to Death. Well, so th there's no connecting the dots but in today's message, what we want to do is we want to not misunderstand this verse and a couple of other verses that are also misunderstood. But we want to put forth an interpretation which will be consistent with the analogy of Scripture, with the context, with the meaning of the key words, and the grammatical setting of this text. And, of course, that's the best way of interpreting any passage. It's the it's the four of the five basic things. The only thing I left out is, okay, how has the church interpreted this for, for 2,000 years? So I want to put forth this too. The best way of interpreting this passage is to connect it back to the model prayer. I, I really taught, I thought about this and just in, in thinking about, okay, the Sermon on the Mount is on the cusp of the old covenant the new covenant is about to dawn and so it's it, it can be very and we see this and we discuss this in the panels and I know it'll be discussed tonight but trying to make new covenant applications from an old covenant period can be difficult but you have to understand something the one who is giving this sermon is also the one who gives us the new covenant so he has a perfect understanding of how the two go together. And I think it's for us to see as well as we study the Scripture. So the first thing that he talks about in verses 1 through 5 is forgive as you are forgiven. The parallel passage of this is in Luke chapter 6, uh, especially verses 37 through 42. And you need to remember that this section connects back, again, as we think about context, to the greater righteousness uh, in verse, verses 17 through 20 of chapter 5, the greater righteousness and the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Now, there are two things that I want you to be clear about as we go through this particular section. The first thing I'm going to try to do is to explain what he means here by judge, the word judge, do not judge so let's think about the meaning of that word and then the second thing that I want you to, to think about is what does it mean that you will not be judged because a lot of people think this okay if I don't judge then I won't be judged you think that's true if you put that together with the rest of Scripture, does that hold true? It does not. This is not an escape clause. It's something else. So let's look at it together. Again, the word judge, krithos, in both the Greek and the English have a wide variety of meanings. So the key here is to connect with verse 5. Back to where he talks about the merciful. Uh, chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
In Luke, this passage follows Jesus' teaching on loving your enemies. And that's very important. So context, again, is very important. Now, the word itself in the context would mean this. It would mean to make a censorious or condemnatory statement and to follow that up with commensurate actions. That's a great definition. I'll give it to you one more time. It means to make a censorious or condemnatory statement and to follow that up with commensurate actions. So I make a critical judgment. When I say critical, I don't mean evaluative. I mean to criticize, to put down, to condemn. To make a hateful remark. To make a remark that means that person, it demeans them, takes away their value, and then I act accordingly. I told you last week my wife has been watching Little House on the Prairie almost nonstop. And this reminds me of a character on Little House on the Prairie. Do you know who that character might be? Mrs. Olson. She is one of the most judgmental people who follows it up with commensurate action that I've ever seen. That's our first television reference for today, Phil. I don't know if there will be any more, but uh, anyway, that's, at least we got that one out of the way. So, verse 6 then follows this with a strongly worded response. And again, it's a word play in the Greek uh, that that says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, do not throw. So again, there is is this idea that you're not to make a, a condemnatory judgment, but that doesn't mean that you don't make a judgment at all. And then he says this in verse 2, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. Again, another word play here. And by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. According to many rabbis, God had two standards of measurements. Judgment and mercy. And he who makes a condemnatory judgment upon another person without mercy is is scarcely open to mercy themselves. To condemn another person is not an act of mercy and forgiveness, and so it has no claim for that person at the last judgment. So if I, if, I, if I make a condemnatory judgment, and I demonstrate that in my character there is no mercy and no grace, then he says, okay, the way you judge, it's going to be meted out to you. So when I stand to face judgment, this may not just mean the last days, but it certainly does mean the last days, then the, the, the lack of mercy and the lack of grace that I have shown will be measured back to me. And then in verses 3 through 5, we have the illustration that makes the point. And again, the point as he makes it, the illustration doesn't say you're not to, to make a judgment. It says, or it gives a proper context for making a judgment. So the illustration makes the point. The word karphos is, a, is the word which means speck of sawdust or foreign matter. It's like when you get something in your eye. You know, it's just kind of irritating. And you, you want to get it out. And he compares that or contrasts that to the word dophos, which is a plank or a log, translated beam sometimes. So Jesus is not saying here that you should not help your brother, but that you must first of all see your own failures and sins before you do. It is hypocritical to try to stand in the place of God. That is not our place. It is not our calling. When I try to help someone else, and and, and Eric prayed this in his prayer, in discipleship, before I 
help others in discipleship, I need to help myself. I need to see how the text speaks to me. I need to understand what my failures are, what my shortcomings are. You know, sometimes in life, we have a way of forgetting our mistakes. We have a way of thinking, really just creating this huge blind spot as if it never happened. And then we deal with other people as if we've never had a failure. It is much better when you deal with people to remember your own failures. To remember what it was like, what the experience was like when you too failed. When you too sinned. To know what it was like to, to see the consequences, the hurt that it causes. And to think about that you've sinned against God. Do you see that in the illustration this morning that Dan read from 2 Samuel? Where David has completely forgotten everything that he has done in the matter of Bathsheba and Uriah. And so when he hears the little parable about the man who takes the other man's little ewe lamb, he is indignant. That man ought to die. That man ought to restore the sheep fourfold. Can you imagine how he must have felt when Nathan said, David, you're that man. How different would it have been, maybe, if David, even after he had done this, had repented and, and it had changed his life for the better. But it didn't. Because he was arrogant. Because he was judgmental. And we need to beware lest the same thing happens to us. We can help others. We can make discerning comments. We can come to their aid and say, brother or sister, here, here's something that you need to pray about and be concerned about and be aware of but not from the standpoint that, you know, I've never failed. And, and you know what? You are just lower than low that you've done this. I can't, I can't believe that you, that you would do this. I mean, look at me. I would never do that. Do you see the difference? That's what the text is teaching. How different is it when you say, you know, I once faced that. I know what you're going through. And I want to see you get help. Or I want to see you come out of this. I want to be gracious and I want to be merciful. Gulick said that our response to others betrays whether we are protective and vindictive of our own concerns and it demonstrates the capacity to experience God's overture of mercy and forgiveness so here's the deal am I out for my own interest when I bring something to someone's attention that they've done wrong Am I out for my interest? Am I out for vindictiveness? Or do I know that by the grace of God, here I am, there I go. You see, beloved, all of us need mercy and grace. Isn't that right? We all do. And that's what this passage is teaching us. You need mercy and you need grace. And as believers, we've seen in this, in this Sermon on the Mount, you have received mercy and you have received grace. And you're in the kingdom. So how do you act when you're in the kingdom? Well, you come from a disposition of mercy and grace as you have been given, give. Give. 
The second thing, and another very misunderstood verse is verse 6. It probably stands alone in many of your Bibles and your translations. And we're going to call this section or this verse appreciating the holy. Again, it's been very misunderstood. The early church used it to exclude unbaptized persons from the Lord's table. Uh, Some have seen it as a directive against evangelizing Gentiles. Most see it as a directive not to press the gospel on those who reject it. So if someone rejects what you have to say, then you just stop. But to me, in the context, this seems to make a condemnatory judgment that is forbidden in verses 1 through 5. If someone rejects me and then rejects me again, then at some point in time, I guess I'm supposed to say, well, you know what? It's not for you. Now, for me, that's a condemnatory judgment. Who am I to say when this person or if this person is going to receive Christ? That's not my work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Gulick has an alternative, and I want to read you a passage, and if you'd like to read it with me, I'm turning there, so I guess you could too. Uh, it's Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 20. For if, for if after they had escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in, in them and over are overcome. When it says in them, it means uh, the, the knowledge or the defilements of the world, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment and hand it on to them. It has, re- it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So Gulick says that this is a warning against apostasy to the disciples because in their ministry they are going to encounter false teachers false prophets they're going to encounter apostates now if you read the new testament hebrews 6 hebrews 10 other passages you find that i think that the most severe warnings in the new testament are to apostates Those who have heard the truth, those who have seemingly responded to the truth, and then those who have left the truth. Sometimes very dramatically. Sometimes even teaching something else. So the most dire warnings in the New Testament are about apostasy. Dogs and swine stand as symbols of disdain. So by throwing that which is sacred, meat used for, acri- uh, for sacrifices, and that which is valuable, pearls, one obviously desecrates those things. So I think if we place the sermon or, or place this, this particular verse in the context of the sermon, then there are two connections here. First of all, we're called to be a city on a hill. And if we lose our our salt, our saltiness, then it is trampled underfoot. Okay, that's back to uh, chapter 5, verse 13. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under one's foot. That is, if the salt has become tasteless. The second thing goes back to the model prayer. Where... Jesus says to pray, lead us not into temptation. This is a spiritual issue. And I talked about this last week. You know, I believe with all my heart, because I believe in sovereign grace, I believe with all my heart that God calls us out of darkness into light. I believe that God saves us by His grace. I believe that salvation is monergistic. That is, that God does everything required and we receive by faith that is a gift 
But I don't think that just because, maybe just is not a good word in there, that because this is true, that we should take salvation for granted. That we should be presumptuous. I think that we should take salvation as a very precious thing. I think that in our prayer life that we should praise God for our salvation. I think that in our prayer life we should ask God to guard us in our salvation and to guard us against any thought or temptation that would ever draw us away from the gospel. You say, well, why would you pray that if you're held firmly in God's hand? Why do you pray for God to save people? The same thing. Yeah, it's in the plan, but prayer is also in the plan. Is it a bad thing for us to pray about our our spiritual state? Is it a bad thing for us to pray, God, deliver us? Is that a bad thing? I, I tell you, I think it's an arrogant thing if we don't. I think so many people live their Christian lives arrogantly because they say, well, you know, I can't be lost ever again and so I can do whatever I want. No! I do pray that I can do whatever I want because what I want is to please my Savior. And I think we should pray about that. I think it should be the heart of our prayer life. And we see this in the model prayer. He doesn't pray for, I mean, the, the, the physical things are, are just passing. He prays the bulk of this prayer is spiritual. Spiritual. Then he moves to the effective prayer, verses 7 through 11. These verses center around three actions. Ask, seek, knock. In the Lucan uh, text, this follows the disciples' request that the Lord teach them how to pray. So this block of verses actually brings to a conclusion the larger block, the larger context here of doing righteousness. It is the last or concerned with the last of the we petitions of the model prayer. And it has to do again with our relationship to the Father. You know, I think Another thing that we all want to pray, I know this is my prayer. Lord, help me pray more. Lord, help me pray more. Do you know that prayer is more than words? Prayer is your life. Prayer and how you pray and what you pray shapes you. And it reflects you, reflects who you are and what you believe and what you value, reflects who I am, what I believe, what I value. Just take a minute to think about that. Now, do you believe that's true? It is that's true. And your prayer, my prayer, my prayer reveals a lot about me, my prayer life. So I would pray, Lord, first of all, Lord, help me and draw me to pray more. And for things that are more important. I started this message talking about the political things and all that in our country. But you know something? These aren't the most important things in life. There are people who are living in in oppressed countries. There are people who are living where just worshiping Christ is is a threat to their well-being. What do you think they pray for? All three of these words engage us to go to God in prayer and make requests. However, think about this. In the model prayer and also in the rest of the Beatitude, Jesus has already told us what we should pray for. The parameters of our desires are set by the relationship. Now get this. You think think I'm going to say by the relationship that we have to the Father, but it's not. It's based upon the relationship that the Son has to the Father. My relationship to the Father sometimes is 
because of me, it is distant. Sometimes I live in fear. Sometimes I live in doubt. All kinds of things. I know this is going to surprise you, but uh, I struggle. I struggle spiritually sometimes. I'm a fairly confident man. I think in a lot of ways I get it, but I'll tell you what, I have my moments. And I'm glad that in those moments, when my desires for God and my passion for God is not all that it should be, that my salvation is not at stake. That my salvation and my relationship with God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not in jeopardy. And that I can pray. And that I have things to pray about. And God hears my prayer not based upon my relationship to Him, but based upon His Son's relationship to Him. Because that's the only way I have a relationship with Him. Don't you see the richness of this? Yeah, yeah, I love what Dan said a few weeks ago. You know, Christians start at the finish line. We start at the finish line. It's all paid for. It's all been done. It's all been accomplished. Now I'm living it out. And for now, I'm living it out on this side of the consummation. And then I'll live it out on the other side. But it's all in Christ. I am in Christ. He pleased the Father. He did what the Father sent Him to do. He mediates on my behalf before the Father. The Father loves Him. The Father blesses everything that He's done, approves everything that He's done. And because of this, I have a relationship with God that cannot be broken. I have a prayer life that is always there. Always there. And things to pray for. And you say, well, you just can't pray for anything that you want. Well, yeah, you can pray for what you want if you want her's right. If you want the right things. Then he gives the example of the heavenly father and the earthly father. Saying, if your earthly fathers who would not give you stone for bread. And again, the play on words because, you know, the loaf of bread then could look like a stone. If you ask for a fish, he would not give you a snake. And the, the word snake there doesn't really, it's not the venomous snake like you think of. It's, it's like this, and we have them here, these eels. You know, you go to the river. I don't know if you still do this, uh, but used to you'd fish on the river and you'd catch these eels. Slimy, ugly things make you want to just cut the line, not, not touch them, you know. You caught them, hadn't you, Donald? You don't eat them, do you? <laughs> oh, man, I knew you was going to say that. <laughs> so he's saying, he's just making a comparison. If, if your earthly fathers don't give you bad gifts, how much more your heavenly father who knows you, how much more your heavenly Father who sent His Son to die for you. Paul says, will He not give you all things? The benefits of the kingdom, both present and future, encompass our whole life lived under the sovereign rule of God. We are enabled to live in this vertical relationship with Him because of the righteousness of Christ. The greater righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Because of this, I live in this vertical relationship with God that is blessed beyond imagination. Isn't this wonderful? This is so wonderful. And then he wraps up this section with the golden rule. Rabbi Hillel was known to say this, and Rabbi Hillel lived just prior to the life of Jesus. He said this, he said, What is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All else is commentary. So the idea of the golden rule was not new with Jesus. Now some say that Jesus was the first to put it forth uh, as a positive statement. 
Rather than saying, uh, do not do what is hateful to you, Jesus says, do what you would have done unto you. Kind of just a reversal, but it means the same thing, of course. But what happens here is that we, we have this vertical relationship with God, so now he returns to the horizontal relationship that we have with others. And it sets, again, the immediate context with our relationship with God. So now, as, as God blesses me, as God does good things for me spiritually, then he enables me to do good unto others. And the golden rule, I think, sums that up. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is there anything better than that as, as far as horizontal relationships? I mean, that sums it up, doesn't it? As you want someone to do to you, do you want people to be merciful and compassionate to you? To, to give you a little understanding? Maybe not to take everything you say literally and to jump on you for everything you say. Then you know what? That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. It's what I need to do. I want to sum this up with this statement. Verses 5 through 20, beginning at verse 20 and going through chapter 7, verse 11, correspond to life and the new age. All that we've looked at in these verses corresponds to life and the new age as inaugurated by Jesus Christ. So Jesus has set all of this in motion. Jesus exemplifies this. Jesus has accomplished all of this. He has accomplished this greater righteousness. You know, really, when you think about do unto others as you would have them do unto you, Jesus goes infinitely beyond that, doesn't he? He does for us what we can never do for ourselves. Right? He exemplifies this. And goes beyond it. We cannot achieve these things in our own merits or in fleshly desires. It has been achieved for us. When you stand before God, it will be as if because of the work of Christ, all of these things are true. As God looks upon you now because of the work of Christ, because of the mediation of Christ, God does not see your sins in a condemnatory way. He's aware of them. He may discipline us. He may discipline me. He may bring these things to mind. He may use them. He can do a lot of things. But I tell you what he won't do, what he cannot do because of the work of Jesus, he will never condemn me for these things. For those who are in Jesus Christ, there is therefore what? No condemnation none never ever so these things as Jesus puts them forth and as Jesus exemplifies them these things are not entrance requirements they are not uh, our, our goal in life because our goal in life is Christ but they are given to us as a guide to our life in Christ and they are given to us as the characteristics of, the king, uh, of citizens of the kingdom. This is who we are. This is who we are. And beloved, as we live by these things as guides, again, not as entrance requirements, not as the goal, because we start at the finish line. All has been accomplished. All is done. It is finished. But we are living in this state, in this seated in heavenly places while at the same time dual citizenship struggling through this planet, through this life. And as we do, we look to Jesus and by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit as we live as citizens now, then we will know joy and satisfaction in Christ. 
Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we are so thankful that we are not on the treadmill of merit or works. We are also most thankful that we are not under condemnatory judgment. That our judgment has been taken in the person of Jesus Christ and that he has given to us his righteousness. And so now, Father, we gladly live as, as citizens of the kingdom and it is our desire to show forth the excellencies of your work, of your grace, of your mercy. Lord, help us to see the treasure of being merciful, of being compassionate. Help us that as we help each other and as we help those who do not know you, when we present the gospel to them, that we would present it in a way that would be winsome, that would help them to understand that we ourselves are not coming from a, a holier-than-thou place, but we too were sinners. And that we were bound for darkness. And we were condemned. But now, but now, because of your great love, because of this great gospel, we are in Christ. We have been forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. We have been seated in the heavenly places. We have received mercy and grace. And help us to show mercy and grace. That we might truly reflect upon the glory of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.